Wonderful to gather together this morning to worship the Lord. Uh, well done for making it through the cold, and well done for avoiding the sickness bug that seems to be hitting so many people. Um, we'll just begin our time together by calling on the Lord's name, asking for his help as we come to this time of worship. <coughs> Heavenly Father, this morning we bring you the glory, the thanks, and the praise. And we praise you for the great things that you have done. You are the one who brings peace who reconciles yourself to sinners, who brings light into darkness. We praise you for the birth of Jesus, that you sent him into this world to cover over our sins. Lord, we praise you for the good that you continue to do, all that you are doing to teach us, sustain us, watching over us. Please help us, Father, in our time this morning. Hear our prayers. Speak to us through your word and be with us as we worship you in all we do. Lord, bless us as we gather together and enjoy this time. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Uh, because it's December, we're going to start our time of worship this morning by singing Hark the Herald Angels Sing, a song that just celebrates who Jesus is and that ties in well with the passage we're going to be looking at later. So I'm going to ask you please to stand as the music starts and we'll sing together. couple of notices for the church family. Uh, the first is that we've had a few Christmas cards given to all of us collectively. Um, if you'd like to see them, please have a look at the notice board through in the other room. Um, if you'd like any information about stuff going on through the week, please pick up one of the notice sheets by the front door. Uh, that'll give you the times for everything that's on. Just to highlight one or two things, um, we have a Christmas fund going at the moment for the Pattersons. So the Pattersons are a family that we support as they go as missionaries to Vietnam. Um, and as a church, we thought it would be nice to have a collection for them in the run-up to Christmas and then send that over to them. Um, so if you would like to give financially to the Pattersons, um, there's a box through there that has Patterson scrawled on it in Biro. Please find that and put whatever you feel like giving in there. 
Uh, also to highlight, this Wednesday is not our regular prayer meeting. Instead, it is track distribution. Um, so if you would like to be involved in that, going around door to door, sharing those flyers that are giving people hope at Christmas and inviting them to our Christmas services. Um, we meet here at, I want to say half seven. Seven. Thank you, John. Uh, seven o'clock. John will take, keep me right, won't you? Thanks, John. Um, so please do come along for a track distribution. And to highlight next Sunday during our morning service, we have our children's nativity. Uh, so that will be an all-age service. Um, also to highlight for parents, this is the last Sunday school and creche of the year. Uh, they're all all-age now until some point in January. Um, so next Sunday, we will have an all-age service, including the children's nativity, which they'll be practicing for after the service this morning. Um, that's all for just now. We've been looking for a few weeks at some things that God can't do, haven't we, boys and girls? Can anybody remember any of the things? We've looked at eight of them so far. Yeah, Ailey? He can't lie. He can't lie. Good. That was last week. Yeah, Michael? He can't sin. Yeah, Zion? I'm not sure about that one. Yeah, Adam? He can't change is the one we're doing today. Isn't that good? That was quite a natural transition. Thanks, Adam. I'm glad we practiced that earlier. Yeah, God can't change is the thing that we're looking at today. The last of the nine things that God can't do. Um, and saying that God can't change sounds odd because it's often a good thing when we change, isn't it? Hands up in this room if you've ever changed. Yeah, every hand in the room is up. That's a good thing, isn't it? Um, if you're ever in an argument with somebody and they say, you just can't change, that's normally a bad thing. They're saying you have become stuck in your ways. There's no way for you to move on. Politicians often, when they're trying to get reelected, they promise change because they know that in our world for human beings, change is a good and healthy thing. It's a good thing in the Christian life as well. As we go on in life walking with Jesus, we will see over time things that change. Our behaviors, our attitudes, the things we like, the things we don't like, they will change over the course of our lives. But God is different than that. And we're just going to look at one verse from Exodus chapter 3. And this is where God is introducing himself to Moses. He's trying to tell Moses about who he is so that he and Moses can have a relationship. And he says these words, I am who I am. God doesn't say, I will be who I will be, or I am different than what I used to be. He says, I am and always have been exactly the way that I am. God is telling Moses, the way that I am will never change. I will always have these characteristics. To think about why that is for God, we, we need to think about the things that cause us to change, don't we? So whenever we change, there's normally something outside of us that forces us to change, isn't there? Um, one of the big changes in my life that I noticed was when I was about 10. And I was bending over in the bathroom and I hit my face off the sink. And I forever changed the shape of one of my teeth. It's now missing the bottom half. That was in an instant, the bathroom sink caused me to change. I'm quite clumsy. Um, it caused me to change. Or maybe you've been in an argument recently or a discussion with somebody where they've convinced you to change the way that you do something. Where they've taught you that actually there's a better way than something that you're doing at the moment. It's really good for us as people to change. But God isn't like that. Because there is no force in this universe that could change who God is. There is no bathroom sink big enough to change who he is. There is nobody who could argue God into changing the way he is. He is already perfect. And that's really good. Because it means that exactly as God has revealed himself in the Bible, he will always be. Exactly as loving as he has shown he is, he will always be. He will always be as merciful as he is. He will always be as just as he is. That means for us that God is permanent. He's actually the only permanent thing that you and I will ever interact with. 
As we walk through this world, we are constantly touching and seeing and smelling and tasting things that will be gone in God's sight in an instant. If you were to go out into the countryside and climb the biggest hill you could find, one day that hill will crumble down into dust. One day the the river Clyde will dry up. One day everything in this world will be gone. It will change. God will never change. He will always be exactly as he is. In one year's time, in ten years' time, in a million years' time, God will be exactly as he is now. And you and I, we can know this God who never changes. We can totally depend on him who will always be exactly like he is. I want to look at one more verse um, that just encourages us to have this relationship with God, where God reveals about himself, I am the Lord, I do not change. So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Now he's using a slightly odd phrase there to our ears, but really he's talking about those people who belong to him, those people who have put their trust in God. And the reason why they are not destroyed is because God doesn't change. Even though we change all the time, as human beings, we're constantly changing from one thing to the other. God assures us that because he does not change, we can depend on him and we cannot be destroyed. Let's just pray and give thanks for that. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you do not change. That Lord, though everything else in this world changes and will eventually be destroyed, we can utterly depend on you. We can always look to you and be confident that you are exactly as you have always been. Lord, help us to look to you for security in that. Help us not to trust in things that will change and go away, but to trust in you instead, the only unchanging thing we can rely on. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And one of the things that we've kept doing as we've done this series on things God can't do is sing a song that seems to be saying the opposite, God can do anything. Uh, But actually, I want us to be assured that as we sing that song, God can do anything, that is one of the things that will never change. He will always be able to do anything. And that is why it is so wonderful to trust in him. So we'll stand as the music starts and sing together, God can do anything. Don't shut him in a corner, don't you limit what he can do Don't put him in a box, don't shut him in a corner Don't you limit what he can do God can do anything, anything at all God can do anything, anything at all Nothing is too big for him and nothing is too small God can do anything, anything at all Don't put him in the box, don't shut him in the corner Don't you limit what he can do Don't put him in the box, don't shut him in the corner Don't you limit what he can do Don't put him in the box, don't shut him in the corner Don't you limit what he can do God can do anything Don't shove him in the corner, don't you limit what he can do Don't put him in the box, don't shove him in the corner Don't you limit what he can do I can do anything, anything at all I can do anything, anything at all Nothing is too big for him, but nothing is too small I can do anything, anything at all Don't put him in the box, don't shove him in the corner Don't you limit what he can do Don't put him in the box, don't shove him in the corner Don't you limit what he can do Boys and girls, uh, you can head out to Sunday school just now and crash.
You okay? Thank you, Francis. Um, Greg is going to come up just now and give us our Bible reading for today. Uh, so we're still working through that section at the start of John's Gospel. Um, we'll be working through that up until Christmas Eve. Uh, so if you have a Bible, please do turn there. If you would like a Bible, stick your hand straight up in the air and George or Bob at the back will gladly bring you one. Or Nan. There's a hand there. <laughs> George, could you get a stack of Bibles? I think Nan. Oh, oh Nan. Excellent. Uh, if you're using one of the blue church Bibles, it's on uh, page 1063. Um, anyone wanting a Bible? Hand up. Sorry, George. Someone managed to find one underneath. So um, You can read it. Uh, okay. So reading from John chapter 1, we're going to just be looking at verses uh, 4 to 9 t this morning, um, but we're going to read the whole of 1 to 18, just so that we continue to get that context. Um, so let's begin reading at verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, this is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. But the one and only Son who is himself God and is in the closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Amen. Uh, Greg's going to be preaching on, like he said, those verses from that passage later on in our service. Um, but just now we're going to turn to prayer again and commit um, the service to the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you for all the ways that you bless us all the ways that you show your kindness, all the ways that you teach us. Oh Lord, we thank you for the work that you have done in Sunday school and creche over this past year. Lord, for all the leaders who serve, we give thanks and we ask that you would sustain them as they continue to do this work. For all the young people who go along, we pray that as they come week on week, they would hear more of your goodness and that, Lord, they would put their trust in you. As they finish for the year, please would you bless what they have done. Uh, would the lasting legacy of this year be a knowledge of you and a love for you. And we ask for the leaders that as they have this time off over Christmas, that you would refresh them and help them to come back in January um, enthusiastic about their service. Lord, as we're collecting for the Pattersons, we do pray for them. And we continue to pray as they settle in Vietnam, that you would help them to feel at peace there. Lord, would you be working 
in them as they continue to learn the language and start to put down roots, think about how they might serve you. We ask that you would use them to spread your word in Vietnam and that whatever that looks like, you would use your servants there to equip the church in Vietnam and reach the lost. Father, we pray for those around us as well at Christmas and for those in this community in Yoker. We pray that your hand would be on all those for whom Christmas is a difficult time, Uh, people who feel lonely, people who will be feeling financially pressured, or people who are struggling to turn the heating on. We pray that you would be with all these people and that in whatever way we can, you would use us as a church to offer hope to them. Father, please, this Christmas, would people not be distracted by those things, but instead would they hear the good news of Jesus? Would they be encouraged to come to him this year? And Father, we pray for all of us just now as we hear your word preached. Lord, we ask that as your word is read and explained, you would show us the light of your truth. Please expose the darkness in our hearts and cause us to long more and more for your light. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, Just before Greg uh, stands back up to preach, we're going to sing together again another Christmas carol, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, that just captures that sense of longing for Jesus that we see in this passage. So we'll stand again as the music starts.
cheeky wee pause there between, before each verse, didn't it? Um, do you know, I've always wondered why the Rejoice, Rejoice song is so... Sorry. I'm on now. That should be me. I've always wondered why that Rejoice, Rejoice is so dour. <laughs> Has anybody ever felt that? Like, oh, do rejoice. But actually, I think singing it just there, I understood it. And that must be why you chose it. There's this sense of darkness and gloom in the world, isn't it? And that's the context for that hymn, that we live in the midst of the darkness and in the gloom. But there is rejoicing because Emmanuel has come. God is with us. And, yeah, it made sense to me for the first time. Um, And that's exactly what we're going to be looking at this morning from this passage in John 1. We're going to be seeing how Jesus is the light that shines in the midst of the darkness. But before we turn back to it, let's, let's pray and ask for God's help. Uh, Father in heaven, we thank you so much that Jesus is the light of the world. We thank you that you sent him into the world. We thank you that he came. And we thank you that he shines in the midst of the darkness. But the darkness cannot, will not, will never overcome him. Father, we pray that you would help us as we look at your word now. Speak to us, minister to us, and help us to delight in Jesus. And we pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Isaiah 9 verse 2 says, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Just sounds so beautiful, doesn't it? It's just this beautiful picture. It's it's good news. You imagine living in a darkened land. A wee bit like Scotland in December. And you imagine the sun never rises. It's always cloudy and raining and dark. And you walk about in the gloom. And then a light dawns. It's a beautiful picture. Those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. The sun of righteousness has risen. It's good news. Or is it? Because light always exposes the mess, doesn't it? Have you ever put the light on in a room and gone, oh my goodness, this place is a tip? No? That wouldn't happen in our house either. No, definitely not. (laughs) Light exposes the mess. Actually, bringing your life into the light can expose the mess. It can be quite an uncomfortable thing to start to uncover what's in your heart. Uncover what's deep down. Uncover the things that you're ashamed of and you've pushed into the darkness. Uncover aspects of your character that you know are there, but other people don't. Actually, the light coming into the world is wonderful news, but it's also quite scary news. It's exposing news. But I want us to think just for a wee minute, just as we begin, about the world that we live in. And I want us to see that we need the light, that we want the light, that we need the light to shine. We live in a world that's desperate for light. We live in a land of darkness. Because light coming into the world shows up what's true, doesn't it? We had uh, friends stay with us last Friday night. They'd never been to our house before. They arrived in the darkness. They came in, they had a cup of tea and a bit of toast, and they went to bed. They got up in the morning... And it was like they were discovering where they were. Looked out the window and was like, oh, this is where you stay. Like they'd been there the night before, but they hadn't been able to see it. The light showed up what was true. It showed up uh, the wee baldy patch in the grass outside by the goals, because that's where the boys always stand. It showed up the, the Wendy house that we should have got rid of a couple of years ago, but our wee girl really doesn't want to get rid of. It showed up all of these things. It showed, us, showed him where he was. Light shows what's true. And in this day, there's so many opposing views, isn't there? You can listen to two news reports about the same thing that will tell you different things. You can listen to two scientists talking about the same thing and giving you different explanations. You can listen to conspiracy theories which don't just disagree with one another, but actually unpick the very arguments that they're seeking uh, to argue against, saying that actually it's based on false, uh, false facts. There's so little that we know of that's true, that we can know, verifiable, that is fact. 
but light reveals what's true. But then even if we do know what's true in our world, even if we can know what the way things are, which I think is very difficult, we find it even more difficult to know what's good, don't we? I was trying to think of an example that wasn't too inflammatory of things that we can argue about as a society. By the fact that they're things that the society argues about, they're all inflammatory. So I went for one that's slightly historical. I wonder if you can remember back to the, the, all the arguments during COVID about whether we should wear masks or not. So we had arguments about whether masks actually stop the virus or not. So there was those arguments. But assuming that everybody had agreed, okay, it is true that masks do in some way inhibit the, the virus from passing from one person to another. There's then a further question of, yeah, but is it good? So some people said, of course it's good. It's loving. Because when you wear a mask, it protects the vulnerable and it stops them from catching COVID. But other people said, well, even if it does stop the virus passing from one person to another, it's not good. It's bad because uh, it's dehumanizing. You can't see people's faces. It's bad for mental health. It's a bad thing. Do you see how complex it is? In our world... We find it difficult to know what's true. And even when we know what's true, it's difficult to know what's good. But Jesus came into the world, the light into the midst of the darkness, and he reveals what's true and he reveals what's good. But even with that, as we said, it can be unwelcome. Because sometimes it shows us things that we don't want to be true. Sometimes he reveals things that we wish weren't so. Actually, sometimes we wish that we could keep living in the darkness because we don't want to deal with what Jesus is exposing. But one way or the other, I think it's clear that we are those who are living in a land of darkness, deep darkness. But delighted, we should be delighted. As Christians, we should be delighted that the light has dawned. So as we go through this passage, we're going to uh, go to a few different parts of John where where he continues to pick up this theme of light. Um, and I'm wanting us to see, uh, first of all, that light gives life. Secondly, that light drives away darkness. Thirdly, that there was a witness who came to the light. And then finally, I want us to think about our own response to the light that's come. Okay, so first of all, light gives life. Life on earth depends on light. You ever thought about that? If the sun disappeared tomorrow... And assuming that the place still stayed warm, everything would die, wouldn't it? What would die first? Plants. Plants would die. Plants can't... I remember doing biology in second year of school. I remember photosynthesis. If, if the light disappears, then the plant dies. It doesn't get food. It needs the light to be able to make its food. The plants would die. What happens if the plants die? Everything else dies. There'll be no food for anyone. The plants will die first, then the animals, and then probably finally us. If, if the light stops, there is no life. It's gone. Light gives life. But Jesus doesn't depend on light for life. Look at verse uh, 4. It flips that round. It says, in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. With Jesus, it's the life that comes first, and then out of his life flows light. If you look at if you've got a Bible there, do flick with me as we go around. John 5, 26. It says there, For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. As the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. That means that the life in Jesus is not dependent on anything else. It is life in himself. He doesn't need anything to give him life. He is life. In him was life. And his life is the light to all mankind. It's not dependent on anything else. Do you remember last week we were talking about the, the opening verses? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And then verse 3, through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Through him, everything has life. Everything that exists, exists because he made it. 
He is the Word. God spoke into the darkness and light came. God spoke into the darkness and the world was made. The stars were made. The animals were made. The plants were made. In Him was life and through Him all life has come. Just as the sun that shines in the sky gives light and life to this world. So Jesus is the true light. You see that in verse 9? The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He's the true light that shines in the darkness to a world that is dead and dying, both physically and spiritually. As you said, everything is changing. Everything is degrading and decaying and going to death. But Jesus is the one who comes into the midst of the darkness and death and brings life and light. He's a light that shines in the darkness into a world that's trying to find meaning and purpose and life. If you look at a human being, any human being, think about someone you know really well who doesn't know Jesus. Look at the way that they live. Think about the things that they do. Maybe for yourself as well. Why do you do what you do? Why do people do what they do? Often it's because they're seeking life. They're seeking meaning and purpose and, and, and just something lasting. But so often we're seeking it in the wrong place, aren't we, as human beings? Sometimes we seek, seek life in the most destructive of ways. Sometimes we seek life at, at the bottom of a bottle or in drugs. And if you speak to someone who is addicted to one of these destructive substances they can understand the logic that by drinking again it's going to be destructive. But at the same time, in that moment, they feel like, yeah, but that's what I need. That's, that's, that's what I need for life. That's what I need to get me through. We can pursue life in a way that is deeply destructive in that way. But actually, we can seek life in, in empty ways that don't lead to anything, even through success as well. I was, um, I don't know if you've heard the quote by the, the artist formerly known as Prince, I think is what his name is. Is that right? I think that's what he calls himself. It's, when people say, this is what I used to be called, you're like, yeah, but what are you called now? Anyway, but Prince, the artist, he, he said, he was asked in a question, in an interview, the question, surely you want another hit? Surely you want another number one? Like, I don't know what the conversation was, but that was the, the person asking the questions was like, couldn't believe it. And they're like, surely you want to write another hit? And do you know what his answer was? He said, I've been to the mountaintop and there's nothing there. Think about that for a minute. I've been to the mountaintop and there's nothing there. I climbed as high as you could climb. I climbed all the way to the place where everybody thinks that life lies. And I got there and there was nothing there. Got to the finish. It's like trying to get to the North Pole and finding that there's no pole. It's like he gets, gets there and he goes, there's nothing there. Just emptiness. Desert and tundra. I got to the very end of where I thought that meaning lay. And you can read it from so many different successful people. When you go home, look at, if you know, like rugby, Johnny Wilkinson gave a massive interview after he won the Rugby World Cup. He didn't know what to do with himself. His world fell apart. He literally thought that he, had, he would reach a moment where he would be satisfied. But he won the Rugby World Cup and went, what now? And get to the mountaintop and find that there's nothing there. We seek life. Every human being is seeking life and meaning and purpose, but we seek it in the wrong places. But Jesus is the light that shines in the midst of darkness. He is the one who gives life, true life, deep life to all who turn to him. And it, I'm sorry, I've written down proper notes today and I'm still going off them. Um, one last illustration. Have you ever watched the Lord of the Rings series on the, the films? And Bilbo Baggins, the, one of the characters, reaches his 111th birthday. Hands up if you're 111. Not yet, George, you've still got another... No, never mind. <laughs> Reaches his 111th birthday. And what he says about his life 
is he says, I feel like too little butter spread over too much toast. He said, with every year, it's just that my life gets spread even thinner. It's not like that with Jesus. He gives eternal life, but it's life that is full and rich. It's abundant. The life, Jesus comes in, the life and light. But then secondly, the light drives away the darkness. Imagine a fight between a light bulb and a dark room. Okay? Light bulb, dark room. You got it? You flick the switch, who's going to win, the light bulb or the dark room? The light bulb. 100% every single time. The light drives away the darkness. And when the light's on, especially if you put the big light on, when the light's on, there's no darkness. The darkness is completely destroyed because the light has come. The light is shining. And you can't see any darkness anymore because the light has consumed it. Jesus comes into the world with unquenchable light. I can't remember what slides I put up. Did I put? Yes. Imagine what this scene looked like 40 minutes before. What would you have been able to see? Nothing at all. It would have just been darkness. But now that the sun is rising, there is no darkness to be found. It's like that fight between the light bulb and the dark room on a cosmic scale. The sun rises and everything is touched by its light. The light shines in the darkness and it pushes away the darkness. It conquers the darkness. And with Jesus, that is in two different senses. He comes revealing what's true and good and right. But he also comes to destroy evil and wickedness and eternal death. He pushes away the darkness, destroys it. In his, his life, his death and his resurrection, death and darkness are defeated. Jesus is triumphant. The son of righteousness has risen and has driven away the darkness. But as well as that, the light drives away darkness in our own hearts and souls as well. And that's where it starts to get a wee bit scary. If you've got the Bible there again, flick to 3.19. This is when Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus. And he says this. He says, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world. But people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Because our deeds are evil, often we flee the light. We don't want it to shine on us. You think of the uh, the choice between uh, a, a well-lit main street or a darkened alleyway. If someone's got something to hide, which road do they choose? The alleyway. Don't want street lights. Don't want anyone to see me. I'll skulk down there. Sometimes we choose the darkness because we don't want to be revealed. But Jesus comes into the world and exposes sin. He reveals it in his life. We saw it all the time. Sometimes he does it really gently. Do you remember his conversation with the Samaritan woman? Where he just asked her gentle questions and led her to the point where he could say to her, go and call your husband. And at that point she had to reveal to say, I don't have a husband. And he says, well, no, you don't have a husband. The fact is that you've had four, five, five. And the one that you now have isn't your husband, is he? He reveals her unrighteousness draws it out of her and in the end she goes away rejoicing because she's come in, in to contact with the light but she could have gone away miserable she could have gone away wanting to hide in the darkness and we see that with the pharisees when jesus tries to expose their sin he uses quite a harsh way of speaking to them he says to them uh, i haven't written down the chapter i think it's john 7 uh Anyway, he says to them, you can find it, it's John 7 or 8, I think. He says to them, your father is the devil. Your father is the devil. He is a murderer and a liar, and you are a murderer and a liar. You followed after in your father's footsteps. Your father is the devil. You, you think that your father is God. You think that you belong to him. You think that you're one of Abraham's children, but you're not. Your father is the devil. He's a murderer and a liar, and so are you. But the Pharisees respond in the opposite way, don't they? 
They continue to run into the darkness. They don't want the light to shine on their lives. Both are exposed. The, the light of Jesus shines into both situations. But one walks down the main street and one skulks off into the alleyway. Which then brings us to the third point. That a witness to the light comes. A witness to the light has come. If you read with me in, in verses uh, 6 and 7. It says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. It's a bit of a, a strange thing that we're getting told here. I think it's one of those times where the Bible mixes their metaphors because a minute ago the sun was rising and you don't really need a witness to the sun rising, do you? If I'd come in here this morning and said, everybody guess what? Look out there. The sun rose this morning. You'd be like, okay, Greg, you don't need to tell us we saw it. But here we're told that, that there's a witness to the light, that the light has come into the world, this unquenchable, brilliant light that shines in the midst of the darkness. And there was a man who was sent ahead of the light to say, there's the light. This is the light. Pay attention to the light. This is the light of the world. This is the light that's come in to drive out the darkness. And we're told the reason why. In verse, um, verse 7 it says, He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. That we're told that there's going to be those who accept the light and receive the light and those who reject it. And John the Baptist comes into the world to testify to the coming of the light so that people will put their trust in him, so that people will believe in him, the light that's come into the world. He is not the light. He comes only as a witness to the light. But men love darkness because their deeds are evil. They want to reject the light that's come into the world. They want to continue to walk in the alley in the darkness and, the, and skulking. They don't want their sins revealed. They don't want those aspects of their character that they're ashamed of brought to the top. And Jesus will do that with us. It's like someone moving into a broken down uh, house and just starting with one room and then the next and then the next, just improving every bit of it. Jesus coming into your life restores every room. And he will not leave you in that dilapidated state. And so if you're not willing to be brought into his light, then you'll reject him and walk away from him. John comes to tell you, believe in the light. The light has come into the world. Put your trust in him. Believe in him. There is a choice to be made. Put your trust in him. John, is a, John comes as a witness to the light. And though we've been told that the darkness will not overcome that unquenchable, uh, abundant light, there is that sense in this passage that those in the darkness might reject it. Those in the darkness may welcome it and rejoice in its light, or they may reject it and push it away. Which then naturally just asks us the question, doesn't it? What about you? What about me? What's our response to Jesus? What's our response to the light that's come into the world? If we flick to uh, John 8, 12. John, Jesus says here, or John writes, When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. There's a promise from Jesus that he has come in. He is the light of the world. He is the true light. And all who follow him will no longer walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He came to rescue us out of darkness and to deliver us into his marvelous light. But there's that sense again. Are you going to follow or are you going to reject? Are you going to continue in the darkness saying, I'm okay here with my own little light, such as it is. I think I've got enough light. I don't need you, Jesus. Or are you going to turn to him? 
I'm so glad that you have, the sun has risen. I'm so glad for the light that shines. I'm so glad for how you reveal what's true. I'm so glad for how you reveal what is good. I'm so glad that you shine your light into me, revealing my imperfections, my brokenness, and bringing it all into the light so that I can be restored by you. As we face that question, maybe you're thinking, oh Greg, I wish you'd just gone a wee bit easier about the exposing the darkness. There's things that I'm ashamed of. There's things that I, don't, I just don't want to be brought into the light. I, I know that God knows everything, but I don't want him to know that. If you are ashamed this morning, can I encourage you to come into the light? Because although the light exposes, it exposes with one who is full of grace and truth, who loves you and is able to help you, who, who wants to bear your burdens and help you forward. One who came into the world for your sin and shame and died on the cross so that you could be forgiven. One who loves you. That's the one you come to. That's the one who is the light. Let his healing rays expose and cure or perhaps this morning you're thinking, oh, I'm still thinking about that introduction. Thinking about the mess of the world. Thinking of the fact that just with the, the way that the internet spews information into the world, I don't know what's true anymore. I don't know who I am anymore. I don't know anything. I long for truth. Well then, this morning rejoice that he is the true light who shines in the midst of the darkness. He is the one who exposes what is true. Read the Bible devour it, love it, see who, the, who God says you are, see what God says about the world, see what God says about this creation and the way it is and, and about the eternity to come, revel in his truth or perhaps it's a longing for meaning and purpose, there is a promise of this light that comes into the world to lead you through life and into your eternal home with your heavenly father. He gives meaning and purpose, life and light to all. Or perhaps this morning you are just rejoicing. I wonder if, can you go to the candle picture? Thank you. Perhaps this morning, I, I was thinking that this in some ways represents the birth of Jesus in the stable. Because at that moment, hardly anyone knew at that moment, only Mary and Joseph knew, really. And two minutes later, the shepherds knew because the angels had appeared to them. But there is this moment where this light comes into the world and it seems small and insignificant. It looks like it can do nothing. The light comes into the darkness. A light that had never shone in the world in this way before. The Lord Jesus comes as the light. His light starts to illuminate Illuminate all things. Like the sun that was rising on that scene. Jesus comes. And I want us, if we go to the, next, the last slide. No, the second last. <laughs> Jesus comes into the world to give light. And I want us to rejoice. The, the manger scene? No? Oh, I must have taken it out. Uh, I want us to imagine just that birth of Jesus. The light coming into the darkness. Rejoice that Jesus came. Rejoice that he shines into this world. Rejoice that he gives life and life to the full. Rejoice that he can expose your sin and cure it. Rejoice because we are the people walking in darkness who have seen a great light. We are those who are living in a land of deep darkness on whom a light has dawned. Hallelujah. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we rejoice in the coming of the Lord Jesus. We thank you that he was and is the light that's coming into the world. We thank you that his light continues to rise and continues to reveal and one day will uh, expose all, cover all. Father, as we live in this world, we rejoice 
in the Lord Jesus. We rejoice in the light that he gives. And we ask, Father, that this Christmas you would help us to reflect on this truth, this wonderful truth that John uh, taught, that the light of the world had come in. The one who had given life is here. And we ask, Father, that you would help us to receive him and to receive the life that he gives. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, we're going to stand and sing our closing hymn, Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery. And we'll stand to sing as the music starts. people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. We praise him in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>